Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today, I am so excited to have my friend Vivek Patel here with us. Welcome, Vivek. Hi, Sarah. So glad to be here. Can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, my name is Vivek Patel from Meaningful Ideas, and I have been teaching parenting for a long time, but I've been parenting for a long time too. My kiddo is almost 27 now and just recently got engaged, which is very exciting. And, uh, and so, um, you know, when my kid was born, uh, my wife and I decided that we wanted to parent in a very different way than we were parented. I was parented in a very mainstream, traditional mindset, punishments and consequences and control and rules and limits and boundaries and all the stuff that, um, you know, traditional parenting is about. And we wanted to do things differently because we both recognized that there's a deep uh, disconnection and dehumanization in treating kids that way. And we wanted to deeply humanize our kids, you know, and that was like kind of the central theme that we had. This is 1997, right? So there's no internet. There, there's no Facebook groups, peaceful parenting Facebook groups for me to check out. There's no Sarah and Vivek pages for me to check out. So we, all we knew is that we didn't want to do the things that screwed us up, basically. But from that, because we had that mindset, we started to discover the things that worked and didn't work. And when I say worked and didn't work, what I mean is created a sense of connection and cooperation and unity in our home versus disconnection and control and the battles that we normally see in that uh, traditional parenting, mainstream parenting tends to, tends to create. And so over the years, we started to discover a lot about what not to do and a lot about what to do instead, which I call the don't do and the do do. And uh, that's why I actually named the parenting style that I share. I call it non-coercive collaborative parenting. Non-coercive parenting is like the short form. Um, I recently registered noncoerciveparenting.com, which I'm very excited about to, to have that website. Um, but the full name is non-coercive collaborative parenting because the non-coercive is what we don't do and the collaborative is what we do do. And, uh, and so then what happened was after years and years of parenting this way, people started to notice the relationship that I had with my kid and they noticed the way things were working out. Because at first everybody told me, that uh, if you treat your kid with that much respect and you don't tell them no and you don't give them boundaries, they're going to just run wild. But the opposite happened because what we focused on was uh, allowing our kids to be their full, truest self and trusting that that, would, that was the best option, that if she was her true, fullest self, that whatever that was, that's what she needed, that's what we needed, and that's what the world needs is, is my kid's truest self. And I believe that about all of us. And so then I started getting invited to conferences and I started getting invited to speak. Uh, I had the fortune to speak all across North America and do workshops all over the place. And, uh, and it's just been growing ever since. And it's very exciting for me because um, I love the idea of uh, sharing ways that we can get closer with our kids and create more patterns, uh, you know, workable, effective patterns with our kids that bring harmony to the home. And it's just, it's just uh, a wonderful it's a wonderful experience and a wonderful adventure. So that's what I do. I, I, my social media is Meaningful Ideas, and I write articles, and I make videos. And uh, very soon, I'm going to be starting a podcast, um, and uh, I'm excited to have you as a guest on that as well. And so that's basically what I do and what I share. I love that. I mean, what you yeah. said reminds me of, um, you know, how you said that everyone thought your daughter was going to run wild, and mm -hmm. that always happened. Um, I may have told you this story before, but um, it just you know, when you have that kind of relationship with your kids, what you actually really have is influence, right? You have influence instead of control. And a lot of people don't really think about that until their kids get older and they can't control them anymore, right? right when they're right. older, when they're teenagers. And yeah. what my son said to me, um, my oldest is 22 now. And when he was um, middle of high school, he said, mom, so many of my friends don't text their parents and tell them where they're going and they ignore them when they call and they don't go home at night. And he said, um, with some disdain, actually, in his voice, he said, you're lucky I care what you and dad think. <laughs> um, but we that when he said that, I was like, oh, my God, like that is the crux of it. Right. Is right, like right. when you're teenage, when you have teenagers, yeah. they have to care what you think. Um, yeah. And that is something that you spend that childhood building. Right. That and that's actually what respect is like. Respect isn't yeah. that you're afraid of somebody, which is what people usually right. mean when they say you have to respect your elders or whatever, but respect is actually caring what the other person thinks. And that's, that's I think exactly what it. comes out of that non-coercive collaborative parenting. For sure. That's actually one of my one-liners. It says it's actually on the back of my business card. It says respect re, re, respect comes from caring about 
other people, not from being afraid of what will happen if you don't, mm -hmm. which is ex which is exactly what you said, right? Yeah, yeah. And respect is like that. Love is like that. Gratitude is like that. Cooperation is like that. Collaboration is like that. Kindness is like that. None of those things can we force someone to feel. Mm -hmm. None of those things can we give consequences or lectures or shame or blame. You can't, you can't, that's not how those things operate, right? Yeah. Yeah. They operate from relationship. They operate from inspiration. They operate from thinking about, deeply thinking about what kind of people do we want to be? What kind of impact do we want to have? And what kind of relationships do we want to have? And how do we want to impact the world? And especially if you look at the, around the world today, what kind of world do we want to live in? And how can I contribute to creating that? Like, those are deep questions. Mm -hmm. And those are the questions that I explore when I'm with kids. You know, even if it's, if, honestly, even if I'm just passing by a kid in the grocery store. One day, my daughter and I were in the grocery store. And this kid was like two years old in the stroller. And, uh, and we just happened to be in this, like, kind of like bumping around each other in the aisle because there wasn't a lot of room. So my daughter and I both said hi to the two-year-old and said, oh my God, that's such a great toy you have. I can't, that's so exciting. And we just like whatever to really make the kid feel like we really saw them in that moment. They showed us their toy. Oh, look at this, right? And then this kid was so... And, the, and I handed the parents my card because I always do that. <laughs> and I said, check out my videos uh, on my YouTube channel. I just, I just passed over 200 videos on my YouTube channel, parenting videos wow. on my YouTube channel. Yeah, it's a lot of content. And, uh, and then as the, as the parents were, were strolling their kid away down the aisle, this kid kept straining its neck around to keep, to keep interacting with the two of us. Even when it got all the way to the other end of the aisle, it was trying to crawl out of the stroller to come back to the two of us. And then the parents came back and said, okay, there's clearly something about you too. <laughs> there's clearly something going on. What is it? And I had a chance to explain a little bit to them, you know? So kids are like, what that means to me is kids are aching for that kind of connection. You know, they're aching to be seen uh, and to be celebrated for, for who they are. And, you know, when my kid was born, like, psychically i could hear her speak to me and she said dad if you treat me like most parents treat their kids i'm going to hate you when i'm a teenager mm -hmm. and i said noted thank you very much for the warning you know literally when she popped out she said that to me <laughs> <laughs> i looked into her eyes and the first thing that she saw were, was when she popped out were my eyes and we looked right into each other's eyes and i just said i love you i love you i love you i love you mm -hmm. and then that's what then that's what she responded back to me with yeah i mean because what you know, what that really heavy handed um, parenting does that, you know, using a lot of consequences and yelling and uh, threats and all of that is it really breaks the relationship. I um, I had a client years ago who was on board with peaceful parenting, but her partner wasn't. Mm. And they had a very, very, very strong little four-year-old. And she relayed to me one night, the dad, she was out and the dad was trying to get the four-year-old ready for bed. And um, she wasn't cooperating. And he kept saying, okay, well, no shows tonight if you don't put your pajamas on. And then she said, I don't care. And he, and it reminds me of <laughs> the breakfast club actually. And he, she, he said, okay, fine. No shows tomorrow either. And she said, I don't care. And then he said, no shows for the rest of the week. And oh, she boy. said, I don't care. And he, and he said, you don't care about your shows. And she said, I don't care about you. Oh, isn't that wild? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. really intense. anyhow, so that's a good segue though, to yeah. people who are listening, who are thinking like, okay, great. Like non-coercive parenting, collaborative parenting sounds really good because yeah. I really like that idea of the connection yeah. and the mutual respect, but right. you know, I do have to move through the day yeah. and you know, often a four-year-old's agenda is not going to be aligned with a parent's agenda in terms of, you know, four-year-old would probably rather not go to bed, um, stay up and right. play with mom and dad or whatever. And, you know, if you, if you're an unschooler, maybe you can have your child can have a later bedtime and sleep in later or whatever, if they're not in school, but if you have to get up and go to work and daycare the next morning, getting a kid to bed is an important thing to do for health, right? For sure. So for sure. How, how do you, how do you use non-coercive parenting in a way that fits in with quote the real world where there are these external um you know external uh limitations sure absolutely and like i said my kid's 26 right so we uh we've been through uh, all of that <clears throat> and not only that but i've had the good fortune to work with a lot of kids uh throughout the years um, i volunteered in school for so many years when my kid uh I, my, my saying is um, my kid, when my kid went to kindergarten, they did, they held onto my leg. So I stayed for nine years <laughs> and, uh, 
And they even gave me my own classroom when I, I, I volunteered so much. And I taught the whole music program in grade eight because they didn't have a music teacher. And I know the instruments well enough. And so I, like, I spent a lot of time with the kids in the classroom. I've also taught martial arts for kids and I taught dance for kids. And I volunteer at youth conferences for like the last 15 uh, years or so, ever since my kid was in grade six. So I've w worked with a lot of different kids. And over and over and over again, I find that when kids feel a sense of connection, when they feel a sense of belonging, when they feel a sense of respect, the desire for cooperation comes naturally. And so this is something that I think is really important for us to, to think about again is, one of my sayings is inspire the desire and the behavior will follow. Um, but the opposite is also true, that if you inspire the opposite desire, you're gonna see a lot of the opposite behavior, right? Um, an uh, for, so when I think about food and hygiene and sleep and messes and hitting the siblings and, uh, and swearing and stealing and not doing homework and, uh, and, and all the things, picking up the toys, all the things in life that we, we manage with kids on a regular basis. Um, when I think about that, and I think, which seems more, which seems more effective to me, to use a, a relationship-based approach, a play-based approach, exploring values, uh, tuning into needs and feelings and learning about our needs and feelings, uh, with a safe guide, an approach that's self-empowering and, uh, and affirming of their autonomy and, and their shared humanity. When I think about that kind of approach, and then I compare it to an authoritative hierarchical power structure. Sorry, I, it's my pet peeve, authoritarian, not authoritative. Yes, no, but I use authoritative on purpose because it's, still got, a, because it's still got an authority, it's still got an authority hierarchy in it. It still allows for consequences. It still allows for rules. It still allows for the parent to have control over the child. And non-coercive breaks away from that. Authoritative is what I call a transition philosophy, where it's not, we're not, and by the way, the person who coined those terms, um, they, they believe firmly and has said this openly that you cannot parent effectively without spanking. Really? So I take, yes, I well, take that, those. And that was the uh, 60s though, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, so, so I take those labels with a grain of salt because of the person who created them, right? The, the person who created them had this idea in their mind. And if you actually read the original definitions and the re original studies, it changes your understanding of that whole, all those labels very much. Okay. Good food for thought. Yeah, for sure. And so uh, that's why I use authoritative on I, purpose. I, I only am correcting you, though, because yeah. a lover tried to correct you, because a lot of people say authoritative when what they mean is authoritarian. Authoritarian, for sure. Not in print. And I know they actually mean authoritarian. So right, I, like, right. That's, I want to bring I want people to use the word authoritarian correctly, but I, I, yes. I take your point about authoritative as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's the thing, right? So so the authoritative hierarchical, the authoritative parenting still has a hierarchical power structure in it, which means the parents have the power, have the power and the kids have less power and the parents use that power to control the kids in certain circumstances, which is what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. non, non coercive parenting says, um, let's try the other approach. So if you think about the, um, if you think about the, uh, the power that parents have, like we have all this power, we have power, we have physical power over our kids. We have emotional power over our kids. This is systemic power, right? Systemic power is power you didn't choose and power you can't refuse. That's my saying for it. I like rhyming. I like rhyming and I like acronyms. Uh, but you didn't choose the power. You have the money. You have, you're bigger. You have access to resources they don't have, food, water, uh, uh, accommodation, travel, technology. You have all access to all the power, right? Um, freedom of movement, you can, we, I mean, we can still hit them legally, even though, you know, most of the people listening to this probably, probably aren't. Um, but we have all this power. And when we use that power, having the power, you can't do anything about. But the question is, how do you use that power? And there's a couple of different things that happen when we use that power in a traditional way, in a way that has any coercion in it, that has any force to force the other person. The way I talk about coercion is you force another person, you use your power to force another person to do what they don't want to do or to stop them from doing something they do want to do. <laughs> and, and so there's two things, two main things that are a problem with that. One is um, that it degrades the relationship between parent and child. Because every single time one human being uses power to control another human being, the person who's being controlled has to have, they know it's violence. They know it's not how they want to be treated. So they have to protect themselves. They have to close their hearts. Like that they little girl to, that I was telling Like the little girl, exactly. It's exactly it. Um, 
And so, and, but even, even, even if they know that you could at any time force them to go to bed, if they know that in the relationship, there's still going to, there's still going to be that, uh, that, that damage in the relationship. There. What I tell young people is I'm not going to force you no matter what. So let's figure this out together, <laughs> right? All of a sudden we're two human beings trying to figure this out together rather than one with power who is who's going to figure it out at, until the point where I'm, I'm fed up and then I'm just going to use my power. Um, so when I think about the, the power and control method and the play relational based method, it seems like in every situation where there's a struggle, if I go into power and, and control, it's going to make things worse. And if I go into connection and play and understanding and empathy and feelings, it's always going to make things better. It just seems, it seems pretty clear to me that if I, if I'm controlling and, and harsh with someone, and if I'm loving and kind and feeling into their needs and feelings, it's going to be a whole different thing. So that's number one. Number two is it sets a model for our kids of how to treat other people when you have power over them. And, uh, and this is really damaging, you know? <clears throat> and so, uh, and then also, of course, it informs them about their own worth. Like, what is, my, what is my right to my body worth? What is my right to my own thinking worth? My own decisions worth, you know? So there's a lot of damages that happen when we don't tune into our kids' uh, to our kids' uh, sense of themselves, to their freedom, to their rights, the right to their own autonomy. So that's one of the things, is, uh, is noticing the, the damage when we don't do it, I think is really worthwhile. When, when I was parenting, what I would do is I would be looking for when my kid would close and when they would open. When they would close, I would make a note. Okay, whatever I just did, remember that. Don't do it again. Basically, you know, it sounds simplistic. But I, but I would. That's how I learned. I would, know, I would watch, and if they close down, um, I would, I would shift, and I would try something different. And this is the thing about non-coercive parenting: is it's not a series of things that you just, uh, you just do and it works. It's, it's based on, it's based on principles and values. And I have a principle of non-violence. I have a principle of humanizing the people that I'm with. I have a principle of using power with integrity. These are my life values that I want to operate from. And, um, and because of that, uh, it's not all, it's, it's the, so non-coercive parenting has two benefits to it. One is that I'm in alignment with my values. And two is that it's effective. <laughs> and so the effective part is, is really important, right? If it was only one without the other, it would be questionable. Um, although, even if it made things worse, I would still recommend doing it. Because it's kinder. Because it's yeah. more human, because it's the way I want us to learn to treat each other. I always say, even if it takes twice as much effort to treat someone kindly, especially your kids, let's put that effort in. It's worth it. It's mm -hmm. worth it. It's worth it for the model. It's worth it for the relationship with you. And it's worth it for the relationship they have with themselves. But it's also more effective, which is what I love about it. Because one of the things about non-coercive pa parenting is we're trying to set up effective patterns in our home. The home is a community. It's what I call a holistic ecosystem. Um, every part of the system affects every other part of the system. How you deal with food is going to affect how they feel at bedtime. For example, if you f make a kid eat, let's say you put broccoli on their plate and you can force them to just eat one piece because you think they got to at least try it. That act of force uh, goes into the child's nervous system as a, as a memory of force, even if they don't remember it later on. And then when you tell them to go to bed, that that part of their nervous system activates and then they push back like this other kid, right? the kid the kid probably didn't not want to go to bed it's like my 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 uh my my friend my, one of my sister's friends in high school told me this story he was in the shower and he had finished he was like he was in high school right so he was older he he finished showering he was getting out of the shower and his mom knocked on the door said time to get out of the shower and he went back, back in. in the shower <laughs> yeah he, yeah i mean the, just further to your point i want to highlight that a little bit yeah. that whenever kids or any people feel that their power is being taken away, they're going to look for ways to equalize and to get their power right. back. Right. Um, and that often, you know, I have parents who say, well, you know, I had to force them into their car seat or force them into this or, you know, and I, well, you're going to see that you're going to see that lack of power pop up in other ways. Yeah. And that's sure. the, that's the trade-off, right? That's the, yeah. um, 
that's it will come back to bite you. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's like that song. Uh, there was an old woman who swallowed a fly. Do you know that song? Yeah, yeah. There was an old woman who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. <laughs> that's how the song goes. And then what? What did she do? The fly. The fly was a problem. So she, she swallowed, swallowed a spider. spider the fly. Right. And, uh, swallowed the which swallowed the bird to catch the spider. Exactly. That was yeah, the she's yeah. That sing to us growing up. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it, right? And coercion is like that. The first act of coercion, you may not notice the effect of it, but then you add another and another, and then what happens is because the effect gets bigger, the the force has to get bigger, the disconnection has to get bigger, and suddenly you're not only swallowing a spider, but the bird and the cat and the dog and the cow <laughs> and eventually the horse, right? And the last line is. There was an old lady who swallowed a horse. She's dead, of course. <laughs> <laughs> love that, Vivek. That's hilarious. Yeah, what a, yeah. What a funny connection. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. It came to me when I was when I was thinking about this podcast. I was thinking like, like, like you know, like an example. A beautiful example is I, my life is so full of uh, stories of treating kids this way and watching amazing things happen. So I'm at one of the youth conferences that I that I volunteer at, and what they do is they take kids from the most difficult areas of Toronto and they bring them all together. It's an organization called Future Aces that I love. And, uh, and I volunteer uh, for, for many years. Um, and, and I was sitting at a table at lunchtime, and one of the other facilitators had their two-year-old, two-year-old, rambunctious two-year-old, ah, running around, saying no to everyone and everything. And the kid had spilled some water on the table, so the parents are trying to get them to clean it up, to teach responsibility, right? And the kid would not have anything to do with it. Cross the arms, turning away throw the napkin, spill more water. <laughs> the parents are getting frustrated. And everybody knows what I do. So they're all kind of looking at me. And then at one point, they got distracted. So then the kid looked at me and I said, hey, kid, look at this. And I spilled more water on the table. And I started drawing with it. And I started flashing it and flicking it. And I flicked it. I said, can I flick it at you? I asked for consent first. And she said, yeah. And I flicked it at her. And then she flicked it at me. And then without even saying a word, after about 30 seconds of play, I just handed her a napkin like this. And she took it from me and I took one and we just cleaned it up together. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to say clean it up, kid. It was a natural part of our experience. Mm -hmm. And then her parents turned around and saw the two of us cleaning up and their eyes bulged out of their head. They're like, what's happening, right? Imagine, imagine that's the approach you take all the time with your kids. Yeah. Like all of the, all of the patterns of disconnection and defiance that you right now have will start to dissipate. It takes some time to rewrite, re rewrite old patterns. Um, but rewriting new patterns that are based on ha, ha, brain development and the priorities of kids and where, and like you said, like a four-year-old has certain priorities. So doesn't it make sense to use, to, to engage our strategies to be in alignment with their priorities, in alignment with their nervous system, in alignment with their brain development? It makes so much more sense than trying to fight against those things, right? And when we're fighting against those things, we're swallowing a, 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 um, a spider to catch the to catch the fly, and it just builds from there. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that um, it's not as much. Uh, I mean, and this is, you know, I I raised my kids the same way that you raised your kids, and um, I. It's funny because I didn't feel that um, strange to me while I was doing it. Yeah. Um, but you know, and only until you start to like hear other other things, but. So what I'm hearing is it's more, uh, it's in all of the day-to-day -day interactions. It's not in as much as like, how do we get them to go to bed in a non-coercive way? Right. It's a, it's right. like, a, it's not, you can't isolate out um, different points of the day and look at those as separate from, right. from the entire way. It's a way of, um, it reminds me of the conversation that I had with Iris Chen in the summit when we talked about the title of it was a new way of being with with uh strong little kids mm. and what we really talked about was the power with versus power over and mm. how it's not about you know tips and strategies but it's about changing your whole way of thinking about the relationship and you know i was just thinking when you were talking about um you know that uh everyone trying to force this kid to do something to you know clean up the clean up the water um a good guideline for non course of collaborative parenting is what would you do if the person that you're trying to arrange something with or work something out with was another adult. Right. Right. Like yeah, you wouldn't be sure. threatening your, you know, if you wanted your partner to do the dishes, you wouldn't be like threatening them and telling them they had to do it or else. Um, yeah. You know, you'd be saying like why it was important to you. And um, I don't, I mean, I don't know what else you would say, but, but it would be a completely different kind of conversation. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, yeah, actually, absolutely. Chores, chores suck, but cooperation and caring for the, for the mutual uh, living space is wonderful, right? There's a whole different mindset there. And one of the things that, that I'm really careful with <clears throat> with young people is a principle I call no wrongness. No wrongness is where I, I'm very careful about using shame and blame with kids. And I think, you know, in the conscious parenting, gentle parenting world, I think we're very aware of that, um, and which really makes me happy. I love, I love how, you know, I mentioned transition philosophies before. I love how there's a big transition happening right now from the old mindset of control and hierarchy and power and violence to something more human, something more connected. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always seeing people making posts saying, I want to treat my kid with more hum humanity, with more, I want to, don't want to dehumanize them. I want, don't want to treat them with the violence of the past and control. And then they say, and you only get one hour of iPad a day and then you take away the iPad. So there's still, there's still like some, of, that's why I don't like the word authoritative, right? Because it still allows you to take that iPad away. Um, but, but if I take the iPad out of someone else's hands without their consent, like, I couldn't do that to my partner. I couldn't do that to my, my close friends. And I wouldn't want to, right? But if I feel like my wife is out of alignment or out of balance for her own health with, with screens, for example, then I absolutely would talk to her about it. But not, not to say she's doing something wrong, but to say, oh my gosh, I care about you so much. And I see how this, this is something that, that maybe you could uh, have a better life. So this is what I do. I don't come from a place of wrongness. I don't want to ever say you're wrong for doing that because at that moment, they're doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. I, I know when I, when I am out of alignment, I'm doing the best I can at that moment. My mental health is, is problematic. I don't have the tools to, to do it. I don't have the skills to manage. Whatever it is, I'm not doing it on purpose. And I don't need more wrongness and more shame. I, if a kid hits another kid, they already are feeling, they know, they know that's not the ideal. They know that. <laughs> We don't have to tell them. What we can say, instead of saying, we don't hit, um, I can't let you hit, all the things that point out the hitting is wrong. And I'm not even talking about punishment. Even just pointing out that the hitting is wrong, I won't even do that. Because it's still using wrongness. It's still saying, if I point it out, then they'll feel bad that they hit, then they won't hit next time. Mm -hmm. It's the same philosophy. What I do instead is I say, I see this is a really hard moment for you, and I'm here to help. This is a really hard moment for you, for everybody, and I'm here to help. I don't see a, an aggressor and a victim when one kid hits another. I see two struggling, suffering kids that need yeah. the guidance of an emotionally centered adult. Yeah. Well, and you know? just to go back to your screen example for a minute, um, I think that's another helpful one to sort of talk about because, um, you know, I, I I had this guy in my podcast, um, Dr. K, his, is his he goes by the Healthy Gamer. And he talked about, you know, that it's not about limiting screen time. If you If you have a sense of, that a kid is doing quote too much screen time, you know, their life is out of balance um, or, or it's becoming, he said, it was interesting. He said, you know, you can see if screens are a problem for two things, one of classic signs of addiction, like, you know, getting in the way of other things in life, or if there's so much family parent, parental and family strife about it, like if it's causing a lot of problems in the family. Right. And he said that, that it's not looking at the end of like, let's take the screen away. It's looking at what, what is the screen providing for the child, right? Is it providing connection and they don't have enough connection? Is it providing fun and they don't have enough fun in other ways? And so again, it's like, we can't look at just the surface when we're talking about non-cursive collaborative parenting, we can't just look at the surface, but like, you know, say your wife was spending too much time on her phone, like what was going on with her that she felt like she needed to spend that much time right. on, her, right? Right. Absolutely. And I don't want to make the kid feel bad for those choices either, right? Mm -hmm. Just like I don't want to make my wife feel bad for that choice. Yeah, well, it's serving a purpose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I once I once had this parent come to me who's their kid was like five or something. And they every time the kid would get upset, they would uh, they would <clears throat> hit their head against the wall uh, as, a, as a strategy to manage the feeling of being upset. And the parents and the psychologists, everybody they had tried everything. To, 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 to change this behavior. And I, and I asked them, have you ever told the kid that you actually appreciate that they found a way to manage their emotions and, and it helps them and you think it's wonderful that they figured something out and, they, and you love that they have a strategy and you think it's brilliant that they're caring for themselves. Um, and they said, no, because they're hitting their head. I said, yeah, but has any, they're gonna do it more. I said, has anything that you've done stopped them from doing that? So she tried that, right? She tried it. 
she took a positive of looking at the, the situation with no wrongness, not trying to get her to stop. But what, it, what she did was she helped this five-year-old understand more about why she was doing the thing, what the needs were that she was getting met. How wonderful that you're trying to get the need met because you're so overwhelmed in that moment and you need to get those feelings out and you do that. It's what I love that you're doing that. It's such a great way to get those feelings out. I wonder if we can figure out some other ways to get those feelings out too. And so sometimes you might want to hit your head and sometimes you might want to scream and sometimes you might want to jump in the pool and sometimes you might want to hit a pillow. I wonder what are all the different things you can do. And you don't make one worse than the other, but you show that, the, that what's happening is you're a human being with, a, with, a, with feelings and needs and you're managing them as best as you can. And I want to help you learn that skill even more because it'll benefit you. This is the thing. One of my uh, uh, acronyms is WIFM, which is W-I-I-F-M, which stands for what's in it for me. And the idea behind that is so often as adults, when we try and get kids to do things, we are talking from uh, adult priorities. And, and when we can tune into the kids' priorities and help align the decision with their priorities, how can you get more play? How can you get more joy? How can you have more fun? How can you have more time to do the things that you want to do? Um, how can you have better relationships? The kids get this, you know? And... Uh, and so the more that we do that, the more kids are open to, like you said, the, our influence and our guidance. Um, and, and, but, I, but, but it's like you said, it's like it's a, it's a whole lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. I was at, uh, a, back in, I think it was 2017 when I was in Atlanta. Um, I was very fortunate to be the um, keynote speaker at a symposium for kids with serious medical complications, families of kids with serious medical complications. And the, the host follows my stuff and said, would you please come and speak about conscious parenting? I said, sure. And then the host family took me out to dinner one night and uh, they had a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old and, like, and, and a little one. The little one was running around the whole time. And then after the dinner, the, the, the mom uh, messaged me and said, you know what? My kids couldn't stop talking about you after that dinner. And I said, why? They said, because they said they'd never been with an adult in that kind of environment before where they felt so included in the conversation. They said it was actually shocking to their system. And the reason was, I mean, I, I'm very intentional when I'm around young people, right? I'm very, <laughs> I'm very intentional. So I was like, I was constantly, whenever a conversation, a topic would come up, I would turn to one of them and I would say, well, what do you think? Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. That's one of my lines. That's interesting. Tell me more. That's interesting. Tell me more. Oh, why do you think that? Oh, what do you think might be the, uh, the result of that, oh, I really appreciate that. I'm going to try that. And I really give them that attention. And then half the time I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn to the adults and continue the conversation. It was mm -hmm. just so they know, like, I didn't need to get the adult's perspective for it to be enough. Like I was for both of them. And I, I didn't do it like to make sure it was obvious. I did it just in natural conversation, but I was very, very clear. Now, if I was with those kids on a regular basis and doing that on a regular basis, the way that they would want to cooperate with me. If I, then if I said to them after a little while, I said, you know what, I've been feeling like, I've been feeling like you're really tired in the morning. So I wonder, uh, I wonder what we could do about, about that. Because I feel like, uh, like I want to see your day have so much more energy and so much more life and joy in it. I feel like the tiredness sometimes gets in the way of that. Now they're not going to think I'm trying to get them to bed early because I, because I've laid the foundation, right? One of the things that I say is that we want our, Family systems to be stable, sustainable, and resilient. Stable means it's built on a solid foundation. It's stable, right? Solid foundation means we don't start, we don't try and hammer away behavior. We go underneath to values, relationship, feelings, and needs. This the foundation of, of our humanity. So we want it to be stable. Um, sustainable means that it's constantly being fed because if it's not being fed, the we can't sustain for a long time, right? So what is the food that it needs? It needs empathy, it needs connection, it needs joy, it needs understanding, it, it needs uh, constant updating as we evolve and change. What are the things that make it sustainable? And, uh, and resilient means when it, something goes through a hard time, what processes do you have in place to recenter, to reconnect, to, to, to come back? That's what resilient means. Resilient means you can, you can come back from a, um, from a bit difficult situation. So when I think about a strong foundation, I'm thinking what can make things stable, sustainable, and resilient, and what gets in the way of that? Um, <clears throat> like, for example, uh, for example, 
I was I was uh, volunteering in school a lot, like I mentioned, right? And one of the things I used to do is I would take the kids struggling with math out of the classroom. So this is in grade five now. And every week I would take a group of kids out and we would sit in the hallway and we would do math that's maybe like at a grade four level because they were struggling with the grade five stuff. And there was this one kid who just had it in her head that she was stupid and dumb and bad at math. Those are ableist terms. I don't like to use them. I apologize. But those are the words she was using. And, and, and I started working with her in a way that helped her feel little moments of success. And every time she would uh, do something and had that little moment of success, I'd say, you know that feeling that you just had? Just, yeah. I said, that's the feeling that why people love math when they do that. It goes, oh, that's so exciting though. I said, yeah, that's what's exciting about math. You do this and this and you get that answer and you figure it out. And it's she said, yeah, but I just did that. It was exciting, right? That was our experience of math. For two weeks, I mean, I worked with her all year, but for the first two weeks, I just focused on her experience of math, her relationship with math and her relationship with me as the guide of math. Two weeks later, at one point, the teacher comes out. This is one of the best moments of my life, Sarah. And this is years ago, right? This is like 20 years, well, like 17 years ago. The teacher comes out and this young kid, her eyes went wide. And she said, Mrs. Woods, you know what? I just, I just realized something I never knew before. She goes, what? She goes, I love math. <laughs> oh, oh, my heart, my heart. You know, and just the other, just like a couple of years ago, my kid ran into her in the mall across the way. And she's, and the first words out of her mouth, how was, how's your dad? Ah, right. Yeah, I mean, Seth Perler, you know, Seth, um, who he, 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 he's a executive function guy. And um, he was on my podcast and he was talking about how a uh, relationship is like the most important thing um, for uh, learning, basically, right. like right. for any learning relationship is the most important thing. Absolutely. I love and that. it's, it's so it's so true. And so that's why for me, I'm always thinking about what enhances relationship and what obstructs relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and so like, what enhances it is, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's paying attention to uh, acceptance, unconditional acceptance, right? If a kid, if it, one of the main things in my relationship with my kid is I want them to know I accept them as they are their full humanity, not only when they're behaving well, not only when they're being polite, not only when they're helping out around the house. I don't want them to feel that I love them more when they behave like this and I love them less when they behave like that or I accept them more when they behave like this and I accept them less when they behave like that because then all of a sudden the relationship is them having to fit themselves into this mold that I've created of acceptability so, or they have to reject it and, and push me away. So that if I, one of the foundations of a, of a relationship is me accepting my child as they are. I accept you as you are. When you yell, I love you just as much as when you're when you tell me you love me. When you hit your sibling, I love you just as much as when you help them clean up their room. I love you just as much. I don't think you're worse when you act that way. And I don't think you're better when you act the other way. Now, from a behaviorism standpoint, that's ridiculous to say, <laughs> right? Because obviously behaviorism is where you uh, give negative reinforcement or you withdraw positive reinforcement for the things you don't like. I mean, I, I don't even... I don't even know if we have to spend any breath of talking about behaviorism because it's been right. disproven. Um, like the the um effectiveness of of rewards and punishment has been disproven in study after study. And right, people right. still want to believe it, but it's they still uh, want to believe it. Exactly. If you look at the research that it does right. not, it doesn't change long-term behavior. Right. And so what I what I and say but that, that's the thing about all that stuff, right? Including rewards, right? And so what I try and do when I, when that when that kind of clicked for me, what I try and do is I try and bring that big idea into every little moment. So if, again, if my kid wants to go to sleep, doesn't want to go to sleep, and I want them to go to sleep, um, one of the things that I'm going to do immediately is I'm going to think, am, how am I dealing with this in a way that nurtures their relationship with themselves, that nurtures their relationship with me, and nurtures their relationship with with sleep and the family, fam, the dynamic around bedtime. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have these three, I have what I call the three, the three relationships. It's the relationship with self, relationship with parent, and the relationship with the environment, which is the house and other people and other systems that we have to engage in. So is the is the if the process that I'm I'm using, like if so if my kid is, does, says no, I don't want to go to sleep. And if I push into that resistance, <clears throat> I'm damaging my relationship with them for sure. And I'm also letting them know that when they resist, 
someone with more power has the right to override that. It's all, it's all, it's all messy, right? What I'd rather do is go, I, can, I totally see you don't want to go to bed right now. That means you must not be tired and you know your own body well. Let's do something else and then we can check in with your body again a little later. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and this is not a one-time thing. This is a process that unfolds over time. Why is that? Because one of the other uh, fundamental concepts of non-coercive collaborative parenting is that we're building life skills over time. So I'm much more interested in my child's relationship with their body and their relationship with sleep than I am in making them go to sleep this one night right now. And I know that if I force that kid to go to sleep and they're, and they're upset, you can't even force someone to sleep, right? But you can force someone to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my, my, uh, my, well, my older aunties used to give their, uh, their, their kids. A, a, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> my, uh, my, one of my best friends talks about that too, about the yeah. pink medicine that her, um, that her mom used to get. Um, so I just yeah. want to talk for, I want to go back to what you were talking about, the Please. I love you more, I love you less than, uh, yes. but, but for, before we go to that. I just want to say, I think what we're really talking about also, like, let's just stay with the going to bed example is like a really just a holistic approach. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, the, in, in some kids might want, might want to go to bed, but they don't, they need some help, right? Like you need right. someone to lay with them and help them settle down. And um, so it's, it's sometimes it's also about what support does my child need to do this thing? Because, right. you know, if you're three and, and you might not, know your body well enough yet or three or four or whatever and you just think nah, I just want to stay up you know you might need like your caregiver to just like well let's just lie down and see how it feels and I'll sing you some songs and you know so there's that part of it and then there's also the part of it of um you know maybe they don't want to go to bed because they haven't seen you all day and right. connection and it's just like yeah. looking at the it's 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 deeper than just the surface uh, which yeah. I sort of mentioned that before yeah. Um, but I also want to talk about, I mean, because that's a theme that comes up a lot in my work too, of, um, you know, our goal with peaceful parenting is to make kids not feel more loved when they're this way or less loved when they're that way, or when they do this, or when they do that. And I always talk to adults about like, you know, how's your, how's your perfectionism? How's your sense of shame? <laughs> right? Like, right, right. because that, what, what we're, a lot of us have struggled with, I think is, we feel more worthy and lovable when we're successful or when we don't make mistakes or we, you know, have trouble. Um, you know, we don't, maybe we don't challenge ourselves because we're afraid of failure. Um, and all of that comes from having been raised with this idea of you're more lovable when you're smart or you get good yeah. or you don't make mistakes or you make my life easier because you're neat or, you know, whatever that is. And so yeah. I think that I just wanted to call that out that, that, you know, that overarching goal is so that our kids will grow up and, and not have that fear of failure, not feel like they have to be perfect, not yeah. drive themselves to illness because of that sense of I'm not good enough. Totally. It's so important. And that's the relationship of self that I talked about as one of the three relationships, right? Mm -hmm. and, and every single, in every single issue and in every single action, I'm asking myself, how am I empowering my child's relationship with themselves, with their bodies, with sleep, with hygiene, with chores? Like with my kid, you know, the way that we worked around chores for her, like cleaning up is, uh, is this sense of, of, of joyously caring for her environment. It's not, it's not filled with wrongness. It's not filled with like, I have to clean up or what do people think? It's not that for her. And when she doesn't want to clean up and she like, maybe she's feeling depressed or she's going through some stuff, you know, um, cause she, I mean, she's, she's 26, she's a human, <laughs> she goes through stuff. Then she, then sometimes they, she doesn't clean up and, and she's okay with that. She doesn't feel mm -hmm. like she has to, or she's bad. Right. So it's a beautiful, I watch her. I don't have that. I watch her. I watch her relate to that. Her, her and her, uh, and her partner, they, uh, they call it when they, when they're both not feeling great and they don't clean up for a while and their place gets messy, they call it depressy. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's depressed messy. Yeah. And so that she even has name, like I do, she even has names for things like that. Cause she understands I'm human. My brain is like this. My nervous system is like this. Sometimes I get depressed and I don't want a thing. And then she'll call me and she'll call my wife and I and say, hey, can you come over this weekend and help me clean out my closet? I've been throwing everything into my closet for a week. Can you help me clean out my closet? And for us, the two, when the two of us get that call, it's like, we're like so excited. It's like a gift yeah. for us, right? We were like, yeah, we're, we're there. <laughs> yeah, and I said to you the last time we spoke that when yeah. our kids grow up, we have to find ways to keep ourselves relevant and, right. you know, involved in their, <laughs> involved in their lives. Yeah, totally. Um, 
So, and the beautiful was, thing is, I just want to say, I want to say something to, to that, uh, Sarah. When my kid was young, one of the questions I kept asking myself was, will your kid want to hang out with you when they're 18? And that was one of the things that was so important for me. Because my kid, like we literally text each other goodnight every night. Um, I made a bunch of memes that say sleep well with funny things and I send them to her. And we, like she went to a concert with her, with her, with her girl, uh, girlfriend, fiance now, went, went to a concert with her, with her, uh, with her partner the other day. And, and on the way to the, to the to concert, she texted us. When the opening band came on, she sent us a picture and texted us. When the band came on, she sent us a little video. Like she's constantly, she's living her own life. She's got a job or a partner, you know, but she's constantly with us at the same time. So there's like this, this sense of she has this independent life, but there's this beautiful connection that we share, even, at, even as a 26-year-old adult. Yeah, that is so tender and so precious. It's the it's the best thing in my life, and it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about sharing all this stuff, is I want people to have this lifelong, deep relationship with their kids, and uh, and it's just it's just so meaningful to me. Yeah, I was pretty yeah. much raised this way too, and um, my oh. dad was supposed to come and visit me in September. Uh, he lives in Vermont, and I'm in Toronto, and he had, because of the health reasons I told you about earlier, he canceled his trip. And um, mm. I called my husband and I started to cry and said, oh, my dad's not coming. And he said, why are you crying? I said, I'm just so disappointed. Like I was really looking forward to seeing him. I was going to make me cry talking about it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, well, look at the the bright side is most adults would be really happy if their parents canceled a trip to come and visit them. And it's really lovely that you, you know, like your parents so much that you are unhappy when they cancel their trip. Yeah. And I was just reminded of, you know, when you're talking about your daughter texting you from the concert on New Year's Eve this year, my 19 year old son FaceTimed me at midnight to say um, a happy new year when he was uh, at a party. And uh, <laughs> that was so sweet that he was thinking yeah. Um, yeah. Before we wrap up, I just want to, sure. um, I want to ask you, I mean, you and I have both been doing this our whole parenting journeys, but for some people who haven't been, I think it can feel a little bit daunting and overwhelming to start. And I think that there are a couple of reasons. One, I think people do, I mean, when I said rewards and consequences don't work in the long term, at least to like, you know, get the lasting behavior and type of people that we want to be raising, they do often work in the short term. And, you know, I think that, you know, if you if you're willing to make your child's life miserable enough to get them to, you know, do what you want them to do. And I think that parents um, are so uh, busy and stressed that I think it can be hard for them to think about taking the time and the introspection. And I just wondered if like I, I, I think that this kind of parenting is harder in a lot of ways. And then of course it, it goes into like easier in a lot of ways, but I think at first the harder, like taking the time to talk about things, taking the time to figure things out. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important. And this is why I talked in the beginning about uh, that this parenting style is both values and practicality. <clears throat> and I think it's important to understand that. So the values part, I think is something that we need to figure out. Each person needs to figure out for themselves. Um, for me, the value of treating my kid with kindness and with respect was was fundamental, and I built it. I built everything on top of it. But as far as practicality goes, um, I think one of the things is is it's 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 partially it's practical. It's partially a mindset because for me, I took I, I did what I call I took a bet. Uh, my friend Tanya uh, has a learning community in Kitchener, not too far from here, and they talk about taking bets. I took a bet early on that love was more powerful than not love. And I decided I'm just going to, and more practical. I decided that love was, one of, my, one of my memes is love is practical. Kindness is practical. Empathy is practical, right? Because we think, we often think they're soft, they're soft things, but they're not, you know? Um, they're powerful and practical. And, uh, and so one of the things is that helps us make the switch is believing that love is more practical, more love is more practical than less love. It doesn't seem that way because the world isn't really organized that way. And we don't have a lot of models that way. But, you know, I would like to believe that. I would like to believe that less love is never going to be more effective than more love. So first of all, it's, it's believing in that. And secondly, like I said before, if you think about what's going to be most practical, it's going to be most practical if we adopt strategies that align with the nervous system, that align with brain, brain development, that align with 
uh, intrinsic motivation, the motivation to do something that comes naturally, you know, the desire to, to, to care for myself. Like when a kid really cares for themselves and knows that the reason you're telling them that, a thing is because of caring for themselves, they resist a lot less. It's been my experience over and over again. Um, and so that's the second thing is like really believing that uh, it can be more practical. And I, and I know that people often say that uh, consequences uh, are, are uh, more effective in the short term, but I actually don't believe that. Actually, even, even, in, the, even in the short term, I believe kindness is always going to be more practical. You know, like this time, this kid, I was, uh, I was in San Francisco doing a parenting workshop. And, uh, and this one, uh, I was with the host again, and they, we were supposed to go pick up the mom and the three-year-old were at one location, and I was with the dad with the one-year-old. And the one-year-old, after we were done, whatever we were doing, would not get into the car seat. You mentioned car seat earlier, reminded me, would not get into the car seat. Bribe them, threaten them, shove them in there, stretch the arms out and the legs, could not get in there. And finally, he looked at me and said, Vic, you're the parenting expert, you do it. <laughs> I said, well, I'm no expert, but okay. So I took the kid in my arms and I said, listen, kiddo, I am not going to force you into this car seat because you clearly don't want to go in the car seat. And I 100% honor you. And I'm never going to force you to do something you don't want to do. Why would I do that? Oh, goodness me. No, if you don't want to get into the car seat, I will never put you in that car seat against your will. I just want you to be happy. And I just want you to know that we care about you. And as I'm saying that, this little kid is relaxing in my arms, relaxing more, starting to like believe me that I wasn't going to force. Believe me, because I meant it. I didn't, wasn't trying to get the kid in the car seat. I literally meant, I would never force you, young human. Why would I do that? That's so violent. And then, as the kid was relaxing, I moved them and I put them in the car seat. I said, I'm putting you in the car seat, but if you don't want it, let me know and I won't put you in here. And I buckled them in. I said, I'm doing the buckle, and if you don't want it, just tell me. And I buckled them in, I gave them their toy, I gave them their snack, and we were gone. <laughs> and the whole thing took, literally, the whole thing took less than a minute, right? And, and so in my experience, love is more practical, kindness is more practical, empathy is more practical, connection is more practical. It's more practical. <laughs> Not only is it kinder, but it's more practical because it aligns with how we're built. It aligns with how we work. It aligns with how we want to cooperate and, want, and, how, and how influence feels good. When, if, when influence feels good into us, when it feels safe, we don't resist it that way. That kid wasn't necessarily trying not to get into the car seat. That kid was fighting something. Right. And I took, well, I took the fight. Fighting the away. loss of autonomy, probably. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, before I let you go, I yeah. ask the, the final question that I ask all of my guests, which okay. is, if you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what yeah. advice would you give yourself? Oh, my goodness me. You know, that's a, it's a great question. And uh, because I, it wasn't too long ago that I saw a video of myself interacting with my kid when she was like five. And I cringed at how I talked to her. Oh my gosh. I cringed because I was, I didn't, I didn't know I was operating from sugars in those days. I didn't know I had inner child wounds in those days. So I think that probably what I would do is I would say, Vivek, you need, you need to heal yourself. <laughs> you've got it, you've got stuff inside you don't even know is there. I used to say my ideology is clashing with my reality because I had this ideology of how I wanted to parent, but my reality wasn't like that, you know. And uh, so I'd say be kinder to yourself. Um, be willing to look at yourself really honestly and, uh, and, 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 and know that you have stuff in there that needs cleaning out. Um, if I had known that earlier and if I had changed those, some of those things earlier, I think, uh, I think our earlier, because our earlier were so chaotic because we didn't know what the hell we were doing and all this stuff just, just popped up, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the parents that are transitioning, like it's going to be chaotic too. That chaotic, mm -hmm. that chao the chaos is, is there. Um, I call. I guess, I, call I, I guess that's what I meant when I said that consequences are easier because I think unless you've been doing this for a little while, it does take some time and chaos um, for kids to believe you um, and for them True. to trust in the new way of being. And it can True. that's the sort of a danger point where people are like, well, this isn't working. I'm going back right. to timeouts and consequences. Yeah, I call it the test, treat, and tornado phase when you're transitioning. So there's the test phase where the kids are going to test you to see if it's real or are you going to just go back to the old way? The tornado is when all the stored emotions, they haven't been free and safe to come uh, express. They have to repress, repress. They come out. So you're going to experience some tornado. It's test, test, treat, and tornado. And the treat is when you're not restricting them anymore with power, 
they're going to go wild a little bit and, and gorge on treats a little bit, whatever it is, whether it's screens or food or whatever. Um, you know, like the parent I had that was, uh, that was, their kid was hiding candy in the bathroom. And they, they, they got so afraid this, they came to me and I was like, well, you might want to try a different approach. And they stopped restricting candy. And the kid did go wild with candy for a while, but through the collaborative discussions and learning about the body and learning about the effect of it and learning how to balance it with other things, but still not taking away the joy or making it wrong. This is like three years later and the kid has such a conscious awareness of food and nutrition and balance. It's, it's amazing to watch, right? But it took three years. It's a long time to build that skill, but the kid's only 11. So now they have that skill for the rest of their lives. How brilliant is that, you know? One of my favorite what... quotes is um, from my friend Ned Johnson's book, The Self-Driven Child. And he said, uh, well, he and his co-author said, we have to trust that kids have a brain in their head and they want their lives to work out. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's what I, and that's what ahead. I tell kids. That's what I tell kids. I tell kids, your unique perspective is important to me and it's important to the world. And I want to know you, you know, mm -hmm. I want, I want you to be you and I want to know you. Well, thanks Vivek for being such a, um, champion of children that's what i always think of my job as being a champion of children through yeah. working with their parents um yeah, sure. and helping them see a different way of of relating and being together uh yeah. where's the best place for people to go and find out more about you and what you do yeah my my social media is meaningful ideas so meaningful ideas on facebook where i have hundreds of articles and videos and uh and on youtube i have like i said just over posted just over 200 videos and I'm also on TikTok and all the other social media. And also at MeaningfulIdeas.com, I have a free course called Guiding Without Controlling, which is what we've been talking about, Guiding Without Controlling, guiding in a way that feels good and empowers the relationship and empowers the kid. And it's a wonderful free course, and you can sign up for that. And there's a paid course also on there called um, Recovering from a Parenting Mistake, which is, uh, and that's a, that's a more intensive course. Um, there's a coupon in the free course for the paid course. And, uh, and so I would love for you to check that out. It really changes people's lives. Great. And, um, and that's it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, this conversation. It's been really empowering. And, yeah, and so me fun. too. Thanks for, thanks for coming on.